Welcome, uh, everybody. Welcome our speakers. Welcome our listeners and viewers uh, to this webinar about uh, China. Uh, quite recently, the Chinese uh, National People's Congress decided on a five-year plan uh, and uh, on targets for the next 15 years. And they should show economic strengths, uh, modernization, high quality production, uh, more consumption. Everything would, would be good for the citizens of China, according, of course, to the opinion of the Chinese uh, National People's Congress. And that, of course, is the Chinese uh, Communist Party and the leader Xi Jinping. Now, um, we in Europe uh, and in the Western world, if I may say, are concerned about what does it mean if China has these strengths and this economic power? Uh, how does it translate into military power? And not only in the military power, but perhaps also in the military uh, capacity and determination to, to show the strengths, because once you have a military strengths, then maybe there's at least an incentive to show it. Uh, on the other hand, of course, China, at least officially, is always speaking about uh, multilateralism. We want to go the materialist, uh, materialism way. We want to uh, strengthen international organizations. Now, if you look to some of the activities of China, from the vaccination policy to activities in the South China Sea and um, the investments in Africa, um, it's not so multilateral as the Chinese want to uh, have it uh, seen by the others. Um, so this, of course, is the question, um, how realistic is this uh, multilateral way uh, the Chinese want to go. And, of course, uh, what does it mean when we have a strong China and a rising China, an increasing uh, dominance of China in certain technological fields, uh, with a competition with the United States of America? Some speak already of a Cold War, of a new Cold War between the US and China. And what does that mean for Europe? Does Europe uh, just have to follow the U.S. way, especially now as we have a president in the United States who is, uh, who is keen on having a close relationship with Europe, or at least is keen on Europe accepting uh, the U.S. Uh, leadership. So there are many, many issues. Of course, we cannot deal with all the issues here, but I'm very happy to have very, very able experts here who want uh, who, to will contribute to this uh, debate from the different point of views and the different angles. So um, I do it perhaps in the order uh, of uh, what we agreed upon uh, the speakers in the first round. We have Waltraud Urban, she's a senior research associate at the Vienna Institute for International Economics and is also on the advisory report of the International Institute for Peace. Uh, she will present uh, some figures also to give a framework for our discussion. Then we have uh, Jürgen Kehler from the University of Erlangen. He is professor, as a well, senior professor. He's not so senior, but senior in the seniority, not in the in the age uh, wise. Um, so he will deal with trade issues and uh, will perhaps make a connection to what uh, Walter had. Uh, um, proposed or had shown to us. And then we have uh, Vasilis Strikas. Uh, he's uh, also at the Tsing Tsinghua University, but now he is in, in Athens. He will uh, speak about the triangle between China, US, and, and Europe. Uh, a very difficult issue uh, because, uh, as I said before, Europe is now in a in some way in a better situation because with Biden than with Trump, but some way in a more difficult situation because the expectation of Bidens and of Europeans are bigger. And then of course we have Susanne Wagelin Schmitzig and uh, she was from, from the International Politics Department at the University of Vienna. And she will deal a bit also with the issues of um, the military side. Uh, are there some military adventures coming to us? Are there some connections also with some 
military activities in more or less in the center or in the eastern center of Europe. So I think there's a broad range of issues, but I think uh, China and uh, the relationship of Europe with China uh, affords uh, to have some sort of a, of a broader picture. But uh, let's open the discussion. And I think, Baltrat, uh, you will be the first. Again, thank you very much for participating. Um, and uh, we have perhaps some questions from the audience later on. But Waltraud, you can now start with your presentation. Yes. Uh, and uh, Good it's afternoon. You now. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I will start with a few pictures or maps uh, showing Ch China in the world. So we will try to find them. Yeah. We see, we see the right. So, okay. So China is, uh, as we all know, the second biggest economy in the world, but it's always nice to see that there's still a little bit of a difference to the US. So at the moment, China has 16.5% of the world GDP and the US has 24.5%. And one of the biggest bets among economists and journalists is always, when will China overtake the US? And in this respect, the COVID crisis has helped China before the most uh, forecasts were uh, 35 or 33, 2035 or 2033. And now most uh, economists think about uh, China overtaking the US in 28 already. We will see. But China is already the biggest sub supplier of goods on the world market, with also six, about 16% of the world market. And uh, only if we take the European Union as a, as a country, uh, the European Union has approximately the same share in the world market of about 15.6%. But where the big gap is, is with GDP, you can see that per capita GDP, which means the, the, the income level in the country measure that purchasing power parities is still about one quarter of that of the USA. And this is why China is so keen to, uh, to get more technology, to get more innovation, to get a higher value added per capita, because this is the, the, the principle or this is the necessity to increase income over time. So um, as we have seen, China is uh, the, 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 so to say, the master in, in foreign trade. And uh, it is not only the main export market for, the, for Europe, and it's not the, only the most important source for imports in the US. It has its trading partners all over the world. And in total, China is the most important source for imports in 39 countries of the world. This is so it's it's in in 39 countries of the world it's the most important source for imports. And in 26 countries of the world it's the leading export market. These countries are more or less the, the raw material providers in Africa in Latin, Latin America but of course also in Australia for instance. And then in 15 countries of the world, these are the green ones, China is both the most important export market and the most important source for imports. You can imagine in Australia in both directions is about more than 30%. So you, you can imagine that this dependence on China is rather large. And China has a lot of bilateral uh, agreements with these countries, but recently it has made a big step forward in regional cooperation. We will hear, hear more details afterwards. It has concluded the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership called RISEP in Asia, which forms the biggest free trade area or free trade uh, agreement of the world. And it's also uh, trying to have some cooperation in, in a, a kind of multilateral cooperation in the 17 plus one initiative, which is not a trade initiative, but rather a kind of uh, political, semi-political uh, 
body, which makes uh, some some sorrows in in the European Union that it might split uh, the European Union because there are about there are to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, 12, 12 European Union countries, these are the dark red ones, and then five non-European Union countries on the Western Balkans. And then, um, but China is not only trading, China is also investing, and we can see that actually after the end, um, becoming a member of the WTO in 2001, it also helped to increase investment from abroad and investment outward. And uh, we can see this peak in 2016. This was also a, a peak in Europe-China Europe relations. And afterwards, Chinese investment abroad fell quite significantly, partly due to uh, actions outside China against their investment, but also uh, due to rules within China uh, to stop uh, extensive investment abroad, which was sometimes considered as capital flight and not really a strategic investment. And then finally, I want to have a last uh, transparency showing that not only investment is important, but something which is not, uh, not very often quantified, this is the value of completed projects abroad. Abroad. So when you when we speak later about the Belt and Road Initiative, it's less investments there. There's also investment, but not too much investment. It's more construction work of dams, of uh, of roads, of uh, harbors, of uh, all kinds of constructions, which is done by Chinese uh, finance financed by Chinese by the Chinese banks, which is very often constructed by Chinese workers. And this is a big concern about procurement because all these co projects are done by Chinese and there's very little openness to other investors. But it's interesting that actually in 2019, and I don't know the figures of 2020, these construction works are more important than direct investment. Well, I think I will... I will close now and give over to my successor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Baltrud. I think that was a quite uh, good, uh, concise overview how China is integrated into uh, the uh, economic uh, global situation and connections. And I hand over to Jürgen now on the trade issue or whatever else you want to contribute. Please, Jürgen Kehler. Right, thank you very much, Hannes, for inviting me to this panel discussion. Uh, I'm delighted to be associated with the International Institute for Peace, at least for this event, um, and I very much support and, and admire your mission. Now, uh, in my short statement, I will try to cover the, the points that were highlighted in the description of this panel discussion and go through uh, a few points that were mentioned by Waltraud uh, before. I'm gonna, st and by, by Hannes as well, actually. Um, I'm gonna start with a five-year plan. Um, as Han Hannes said, uh, you, you find a, um, the typical um, jargon and, and terminology in, in these plans, but what I find uh, quite uh, noteworthy is, um, is the um, policy objective to secure supply chains. I think China has learned its lesson from the pandemic and from the trade war with uh, the US. Uh, and China is uh, explicitly trying to uh, become self-sufficient in agriculture, energy, and technology. Uh, the other very um, significant uh, issue in this uh, five-year plan is that the central bank tries to develop a digital currency, uh, which is related to Bitcoin and, you know, the rumors, never, nobody never knows uh, for sure, but the rumors that Bitcoin uh, to a large extent is driven by capital flight from China. Um, the second point I want to very briefly mention is just buzzwords. You know, that we, we will certainly enter into and should enter into a, a more thorough discussion. Um, but I want to touch upon the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, 
uh, that was mentioned by Waltraud before. It was described at, as a low ambition trade deal. Uh, as, as Waltraud said, it's, uh, a, uh, it, it's a very large uh, free trade agreement with the Asian countries and then the big powerhouses of uh, East Asia, and that's South Korea, Japan, um, and, and, uh, and also Australia and New Zealand. Um, and uh, it's noteworthy that that India pulled out of the negotiations in November 2019 uh, because it um, uh, concluded that it wouldn't benefit uh, from it, that it would have more disadvantages than advantages of being part of it. Um, what perhaps is noteworthy and what drew quite a lot of criticism is there are no provisions for labor, um, environment, and dispute settlement. Um, and it has been said that um, for China and other countries, it's more of a, but especially for China, it was more of a strategic motivation uh, to enter into it. Um, very briefly on the Belt and Road Initiative, um, there's a lot of uh, you know evidence and a lot of literature about it. Um, one of the many criticisms is that it involves some um, debt trap di diplomacy. And there's a very interesting recent study by Gelpan et al. Uh, that looks at the issue of these um, uh, contracts, at these um, credit loan contracts. And it comes to the conclusion that uh, quite craftily, actually, uh, China climbs, tries to climb up the uh, seniority ladder uh, that um, that it um, tries to gain uh, repayment advantages in in the case of a default. Um, the next point that I want to uh, touch upon is the uh, CIA, the Comprehensive Investment and uh, Investment Agreement, and uh, the the buzzword that the EU uses here is that of a competitive neutrality. The problem basically is that China, uh, with its uh, state-sponsored uh, uh, enterprises, uh, state-owned enterprises, has a comparative advantage that it can use as a sort of leverage or leverage, as the Americans would say, um, to gain advantage uh, over and above competitors in uh, in Western countries. And a very drastic example of that, in my view, is the uh, solar panel dispute between China and the EU in 2013, uh, where essentially, um, well, first of all, the EU blamed China for dumping solar panels in, on Europe um, uh, and, and tried to impose a very hefty tariff rate of uh, about 48%. Uh, and when China responded by a threat uh, to retaliate uh, with tariffs on wine and on luxury cards, um, I'll leave it to you to guess what countries were targeted with these. Um, the, uh, the EU pulled back, you know, and, and reached a settlement. And essentially, this uh, dispute and, and this dumpling uh, destroyed the solar panel industry in, in Europe. Um, and, and that is only one example that shows how, how difficult it can be and, and how dangerous it can be if you have a competition uh, between state-sponsored uh, uh, enterprises in, in China uh, and and the free market in uh, in the Western world, and that's why this competitive neutrality uh, is the uh, the central uh, principle that the EU tries to follow now. Um, the, the there was a lot of uh, a neg negative press on um, on the CA, um, or CA, um, but. Uh, in all fairness, it, it has to be uh, said that it includes 
provisions uh, for labor, uh, for the environment, uh, dispute settlement, um, and um, and it's certainly uh, a step in the right direction, at least from my point of view. So to to summarize my brief statement, I would say that the the central issue is here: how do you reconcile? two completely different economic and political systems. Uh, how do you reconcile a, a more or less free open uh, market system with uh, competition and, and state-operated enterprises like in, um, in China? You know? And that's, the, that's a crucial issue that, that also um, bothered the um, WTO um, for for a long time and still does and uh, in my view that's the uh, that's a fundamental issue. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jürgen. I think that uh, also the last point is a very important one. Maybe it's very primitive, but I say now we need more market in China and more public engagement uh, uh, in Europe, uh, especially on certain elements. If we look, for example, at our problems with uh, vaccination. So um, it's only one issue, but it's uh, at the moment a very important issue. So maybe the imbalance you, you described very well between uh, European Union on the one hand and China on the other hand has to be uh, brought more into the balance. And as you rightly said, the question is how. And of course, we will perhaps uh, later also speak about the human rights issue because uh, the trade issue at the moment is in connection with it, and the investment uh, agreement could uh, fall because of uh, human rights uh, criticism by the EU. It would be interesting to know what you what, what you mean to that, about that later. Now, Vasilis, uh, you have to unmute yourself, and we want to listen to what you said about the triangle. So, EU already has been mentioned. You will add the US, and then we come to even more complicated relationship. Please, let's see. Sure, sure, thank you. Let me start, first of all, by thanking you, Dr. Svoboda and Professor Angela Kane for the invitation. I'm very privileged to be participating in such a panel discussion with some of Europe's uh, preeminent experts on China in a very distinguished uh, institution, Austrian institution, perhaps global institution. Uh, and so the topic today is uh, China and multilateralism. And I think to understand China's engagement with the international system, I think it's important, it's a good stepping stone to look within the country and examine the political and economic foundation of the superpower. And so when it comes to the economy, China at the end of 2022 is going to be about 10 or 11 percent larger economically than it was before the pandemic. And actually, the GDP growth of China will have returned back to the mean of an annual growth of around 6%. Uh, and I think this outcome is not an outcome of impersonal forces. There's no automation in managing the Chinese economy, but we have to accept that it's rather the solid reformist efforts that have taken place domestically in the past six, seven years. I'm sure Professor Keller knows better than I do that the most important systemic risk for China was shadow banking. And yet the Chinese have managed to tame it, to regulate it in the past five years. At the same time, they have engaged in regulating what we call financial capital, which if left unregulated, it can, it can wreak havoc to our social um, uh, foundations, as we know in the West. And so smart reform at home has really made the Chinese economy recover faster than anybody, anybody kind of could have predicted right um, at the beginning of the pandemic. And that's important because a strong Chinese economy means that China will have more resources to spend in the BRI and in other international projects. Now, what about the political foundations? I remember last year in, in, I think it was February and March, I was reading the social media in Chinese social media. It was the first time I ever experienced a huge backlash from the 
society, you might call it the civil society, but let's say from the Chinese netizens against the regime there. So it was the first time that the regime really felt threatened because of the way it had mishandled the pandemic at the early stages in Wuhan. Um, and somehow there were you know, songs about the French Revolution being published on Chinese social media. Somehow the netizens bypassed the draconian uh, censorship regime. Uh, but what happened after is is that the party solidified its, its governance and they dealt pretty effectively with the pandemic. So Xi Jinping, who was really threatened back in, in March and February 2020, has now returned with a vengeance and he's stronger than before. So what we know about the political foundations of China is that, you know, this new healthsman will be guiding the ship of state well into this decade perhaps the next 15 years or so. So China has strong economic foundations and very strong political foundations, and they're not going to you know, exit the international community. They're going to be more proactive, perhaps more assertive. So whenever we talk about China and the world, we also have to consider the competing hegemon, which is the United States. And so the United States, uh, by the end of 2022, is going to be about 9 to 10 percent larger economically than they were in 2019. And again, this is not an outcome of impersonal forces, but rather an outcome of very solid leadership by the new U.S. administration, by Joe Biden, the nation is surging when it comes to vaccinations. Uh, there are new, new pro-Keynesian uh, economic policies that they're unleashing the productivity of the American economy. And also Joe Biden and his uh, um, uh, new Secretary of State, they're coming back leading in international institutions. So China today and in the next four years is going to face a much more restrictive uh, strategic environment than in the years before, in the years when Trump basically tried to turn the international order upside down. And of course, now it's the time for our union, the European Union, the third big elephant in the room. Um, here, things about the economy are a bit more complex and complicated. We are not quite sure if the European Union at the end of 2022 is going to be a larger economy than it was before the pandemic in 2019. The progress when it comes to the pandemic solidarity fund is a bit slow. There will be election cycles in Germany and France, and when we have elections, in those pillars of European integration, it's much harder uh, for the politicians there to support federal reforms based on solidarity and more integration. However, that's the optimistic part about the EU. If we look back into the four years of European engagement with the international commercial order, and if we particularly focus in the most dynamic region, my favorite region in the world, which is ASEAN, we're going to see the EU becoming an extremely proactive strategic player. The European Union has already achieved two great trade deals with Vietnam, and Singapore, and it has initiated negotiations with Indonesia, which is the largest player in Southeast Asia. At the same time, we have a trade deal with Japan and another trade deal before that with South Korea. So basically, if, basically, if we put all this together, I would dare say without an overstatement that the global commercial order that Trump tried to destabilize and overturn was kind of saved by a very smart strategic engagement of the European economic diplomacy. Basically, I would say the survival of uh, the world trade order in the past four years bears the strategic trademark of our economic diplomats. And so now to conclude, you know, Europe with all its problems, with all its domestic anemic growth, this, you know, huge negotiations and increasingly competitive negotiation between Paris and Berlin and so on, remains a very influential normative actor. And here's the problem. As China and U.S. securitization is only going to increase down the road, how is the Europeans going to react? I think a very senior figure in Europe mentioned that um, as the as the as the Washington and Beijing are strategizing, they will try to turn our union into a chessboard. But the million or perhaps the trillion dollar strategic question is how we, the Europeans, are going to become chess player instead of just letting those big 
behemoths, the Americans and the Chinese playing chess and trying to start strategize over our interest. So I hope we can discuss further. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, analysis. Uh, I mean, it is interesting uh, we'll learn from you that uh, China, of course, we know the economic efficiency and the economic growth, but also that politically also very often is characterized as bureaucratic and, uh, you know, communist, uh, still uh, centralized uh, political system was very flexible in reacting to the first a period of mistakes during the pandemic. And at the end of the day, of course, with drastic measures, uh, more or less isolating the country and so on, uh, happened to develop very well and overcome the pandemic. It's interesting that uh, also the US in some way was more uh, state-led uh, uh, active in uh, beating the pandemic. If we look to uh, the uh, organization of uh, the vaccination process, uh, you know, the, the support for the companies and the orders they have given quite early. So in a way, there's another issue maybe we can discuss later that different, uh, but nevertheless, China and the US have a more public-led development than even Europe. Uh, which is strange because normally we say in Europe is welfare state and here the, 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 the public or the investment has a bigger role to play. And now with Biden, of course, and the two programs he already uh, initiated, uh, we have a strong uh, public uh, engagement in investment and so on. The last point, and, and maybe last but one point, what I want to learn also is that you say quite rightly that uh, Europe, also it's not Asia-centered, has a chance to be part of the growth development if it has close and good trade relationship with Asian uh, countries. So that is also an important point, very often not seen in Europe itself. But the, your last point has been already securization. And then we come, of course, to Susanne and to the subject, what does it mean to be economic strong for China? Um, does it translate into military activities which can endanger peace and stability in the region? And is there some connection maybe with some other military adventures what we see now at the borders of Europe? Susanne, please. Yes, thank you very much, Hannes Swoboda, for the invitation and also for the very interesting initial question you gave me and very much conforms with some of the things I've been thinking about these days because very often we only hear about the success story in China and we just heard a lot about the success story in China. Um, but what does this actually, what kind of consequences does China's success have for the world at large and also for the kind of risks that the Chinese government might be taking? Because as we heard just uh, a few minutes ago from, my, from the speakers before me, um, China has gained the impression during the uh, pandemic that it is the only country that is really successful in terms of um, uh, coping with the pandemic, also in terms of making the population do what the government wants it to do, and of course also in terms of its economic development. And this belief in its own success uh, seems to lead some people uh, within the Chinese elite to think that they can also be very strong in military means. And this is one of the reasons why we see a lot of military tension uh, rising up in the region, especially between Taiwan and the People's Republic of China. And uh, I think we have a situation in this region at this particular moment where the two big powers, the two big military powers, the US and, and China, actually trying to figure out um, how much they can actually do to contain each other or how much they can do uh, on the side of the PRC to reach their military aims, which is uh, quite clearly the uh, incorporation of the uh, province of Taiwan into the administration of the People's Republic of China. And um, uh, I think this is something we as Europeans tend to overlook, but people who live in the region know how uh, dangerous the situation is. There are 
um, planes overflying Taiwan uh, in great numbers every day. There are um, um, big um, marine um, ships from the U.S., um, um, uh, plane carriers from the U.S. and from China um, passing by Taiwan um, simultaneously, which is a very, very dangerous undertaking. And this kind of tension we haven't seen for a long time. Quite interestingly, this kind of tension coincides with a rising tension in Ukraine, as everybody knows. And the question which I would like to answer in my short statement is whether or not these two tensions are to some extent related to each other. Uh, so far, we have not speaking, we have not spoken of yet another elephant in the room, which is Russia. We always think that we don't need to think about Russia if we think about um, global constellations. But I think that during the last weeks, we could notice that diplomatic activities between Russia and China have been growing enormously. The uh, Chinese uh, foreign minister met the uh, Russian foreign minister in China. Um, the uh, Chinese defense minister met the Russian defense minister, Putin. Um, has um, repeated several times that um, he is thinking about a possibility of closer co of collaboration with China, although uh, he also explicitly um, negated the possibility of a military alliance. So just think about the possibility that uh, China, as a matter of fact, wants to use the opportunity of the world still being in pandemic and the U.S. not having really recovered from the Trump area to uh, try and find out whether it can go a step forward in what it calls the liberation of Taiwan. In this situation, it would be really interesting to see what Russia is doing. And I think it is really interesting to, to uh, pay attention to the exact wording that is actually being used between the Russian and the Chinese diplomats who talk about coordination of their activities. And I'm wondering whether or not they are coordinating their activities in Ukraine and in Taiwan, because if something happens in Taiwan, it would be very difficult for the US to do something uh, in Ukraine and vice versa. If something happens in the Ukraine, it would be very difficult for the U.S. to actually simultaneously um, uh, respond to something happening in Taiwan. And uh, quite interestingly, um, I think um, the, the possibility that there is some kind of coordination between these two things happening um, is actually sort of implicitly being um, uh, communicated both by China and by uh, Russia. So what does this mean for Europe? I think this is uh, something we really have to think about because if um, we follow what um, President Biden said, which implies that both China and Russia do not accept the leading role of the US in the world's international order, which implies that even though on a different level, they are adversaries of the um, US, so what does Europe do in this situation? Uh, if um, we uh, sort of follow the assessment of the US to sort of put China and Russia on the same level, this would imply that we are actually forcing Russia to um, collaborate or even form an alliance with China, which would actually be the easiest solution for China. And uh, as we know from the past, uh, especially the question of Taiwan has been a question that um, had, was discussed between Russia under Khrushchev and Mao Zedong during the 1950s. In 1954 and 1958, uh, China already planned to what they call liberate Taiwan twice. And in both cases, they didn't do it. We didn't know at the time what the reason is, but now that the Cold War archives are open, we know that Khrushchev played a crucial role both times in inhibiting the Chinese from taking the step of uh, sort of provoking uh, the U.S. by what they call liberating Taiwan. So this implies that um, if 
China and Russia do have a coordinated relationship to each other, what they speak of at this moment, this implies that Russia can actually contain China and keep it back, but it can also help China become even more risky in taking steps against Taiwan. And so when we define our policies in the EU towards Russia, I think that there is one thing we definitely have to avoid, and that is to make these two countries become close military alliance uh, allies so that they actually push each other into military action, which will then have an enormously destructive uh, consequence both for the whole world at large and for the region. So this um, for the moment, and uh, I hope uh, we will have um, a good opportunity to discuss uh, the different aspects of what has been presented so far by all the speakers. Thank you very much, Susanne. I think that was also very interesting. Um, it leads to the question, of course, first of all, to, to discuss if China, or what are the political aims of China? Because normally, in the past, we already always said, well, China has an economic interest, uh, it wants to grow, it wants to give uh, its people enough uh, food and, and jobs. Um, but now um, some people would say more, more and more that China has also some interest, uh, political interest to, let's say, as the Americans said, dominate the world, or at least to have a strong political influence. And of course, the Belt and Road Initiative has been mentioned already, and maybe we can also deal with that if that is also an instrument of political influence, as uh, Walter already uh, mentioned. Um, and of course, at the end of the day, uh, it's the very important question Susanne raised now, uh, does Europe and US push China and Russia into an alliance because they see this is the only chance together to fight against uh, the still American dominance? Um, and on the other hand, what does it mean for Europe and for the West? Does it mean to be more differentiated, to be more sophisticated? Uh, and um, yeah, th these are the questions uh, we, we will raise because uh, what is important, of course, for Europe is, uh, should Europe be just in alliance with the US, whatever the US is doing, or should, the Europe, should Europe not go uh, with all respect, of course, of American interests its way with China, but also with Russia. I think that, that's some of the very important issues we have to deal with and which we should discuss now. I don't know, we just, uh, maybe we go at least now the same order, Waltraud, uh, Jürgen and Vasilis to react now also to each other. And then we can uh, open perhaps to some questions. We have already some questions, especially of course, concerning the balance of power between the US and, and China and India. Because you mentioned also India, we should not forget about India. Well, Todd, maybe you can react to what has been said. Well, uh, I think two dates should be remembered. The one date is 2049, which, which is 100 years after the People's Republic of China has been founded. And it's a clear statement by the Chinese government that by the year 2049, China should have become the largest economy, the strongest political and military power, and the leader in technology. But what is interesting, when we uh, see look at the last or the recent five-year plan, we also find that it's a five-year plan, and the and and the and the the goals for 30, 19, 2035. And I think um, the idea is this 35, why 35, is more or less the idea how long Xi Jinping will be president, just from his, from his life, life cycle. And I have the fear that Xi Jinping wants to become the unification president of China. So uh, he will try to, to, to uh, solve the biggest problems himself, so to be in history, the great emperor who united China. And so I think this year two, 2035 
has to be kept in mind when looking at, at strategies of China, and, and it's very dangerous, I agree. And perhaps with, with Russia, one should mention that there exists already a kind of security cooperation in the Shanghai Group, because the Shanghai Group is, is basically a security uh, organization, not an economic organization. And there China and Russia and the other Central Asian countries that are members uh, work together already for years. So this could be upgraded to a kind of a military uh, alliance, I think so. Thank you. Jürgen, maybe you, you come in now. And uh, also the question, how should the EU, because you, you started with that also with the investment agreement, should EU um, have a semi-independent position? And maybe also answer, there's one question that uh, already uh, by our participants, uh, Europe is divided. Can, can the EU act as a, com as a common institution or let's say the united uh, institution concerning uh, China and in what direction should that go? Please, if you unmute yourself. Yeah. Sorry, I, I forgot to unmute myself. Right, uh, I'm back on board. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, I, I want to say a few words about the, um, the chat uh, contribution by Angelos Karlovic. Yeah. Um, I fully agree uh, that, uh, and and that's an answer to uh, what you asked, uh, Hannes. Uh, that uh, I'm afraid uh, we we don't have a United States of Europe, and we will probably uh, never have the United States of Europe. And uh, and very sadly, we lost a very important and and major member. Of the EU uh, very recently, um, that was a, a a very sad, in many respects, uh, a very sad um, loss. Um, and um, so, um, I was referring to the um, solar panel case of 2013, and I think this uh, solar panel case highlighted very well that Europe was not able to speak with one voice. Um, and it was easy uh, for China to drive a wedge into the EU um, by threatening um, more or less clearly uh, the French wine producers and the German car producers. And, uh, and instead of trying to save the, the solar panel industry, the thriving solar panel industry, um, that industry was sacrificed. Um, so uh, Europe will find it very difficult to speak with one voice uh, and make the one voice heard if it speaks with one voice. Um, so that's a clear disadvantage, uh, a comparative disadvantage to the superpowers. Uh, now to, to Hannes, a very important question. Uh, how should Europe side when it comes to a conflict? Um, I'm not a political scientist, so my uh, view on this is uh, amateurish. And uh, but but my feeling is that that clearly you should go uh, with uh, with a country that is closest to you in spirit, in uh, in history, uh, in in culture in politics, and that clearly is the United States. Um, now, it was very difficult um, to find common ground uh, with the previous US administration um, that was, um, in my view, <laughs> more a nightmare than anything else, uh, especially in, in trade issues, uh, completely gone wrong and mad. Uh, but now there's hope uh, for a more rational um, administration. And, and I think uh, the next years will see a much, much more a convergence of, of views and, uh, and reestablishment of friendship and um, alliance between uh, the EU and the United States. And especially when it comes to the WTO and and perhaps uh, the um, WHO as as well, uh, where a lot has to be done. Uh, but the the new administration in the United States sent out very positive signals, and the, 
first very important signal is uh, that we have a new head of the WTO, you know, and uh, and, and Trump blocked this and uh, and blocked the, the functioning of the whole um, WTO. So um, my short answer to your question, Hannes, is, is um, uh, for Europe it should be obvious um, where its allies where its ally is. Do, do you think, Jürgen, that uh, Europe can also influence the US with Biden? Because, uh, of course, you can go with the US, but um, very often the US, still speaking about leadership role, uh, the US say, we give the lead and, and you follow. Uh, or is it also possible, uh, for example, on China, uh, let's say, to say, we stick to the investment program uh, plan, uh, investment agreement, because we want to have uh, investment activities uh, in a balanced, uh, mutually acceptable uh, way in re on, on the basis of reciprocity, uh, even if the U.S. says, no, you should not do it. Um, yes, I'm, uh, I have to say I'm quite critical of the United States. Uh, I'm... Um, I'm a fr I would call myself a friend of the United States, but a very critical one. And when you look at uh, American uh, politics or e economic policy, uh, the I think the the, the self-image of the United States is still it plays the first fiddle, uh, and and Europe is supposed to be to play the second fiddle, and and that was quite obvious in. And the reactions that you have from the U.S. on um, on the news of the CIA, um, and uh, the United States were not happy at all with the timing. Um, but um, you know, you should you shouldn't forget that uh, Europe was not very happy with American trade policy at all. You know. Um, remember the steel tariffs, the aluminium tariffs, and um, the uh, first deal um, uh, process. Uh, so um, it's certainly true that um, there's always tension between um, these two um, um, allies. There will always be tensions, uh, but there will be fewer tensions than than before. You know they. The, in my view, the four nightmare years are gone. <laughs> I don't know whether they will come back. There's, there's always a threat. That's okay. Um, but the the uh, the more uh, the the, uh, the closer the the coming years will will be less stressful. I think in the relations across the Atlantic. Thank you, Vasilis. Uh, you heard a lot of, of arguments also from Susanne on the military side. Maybe, uh, of course, you can react whatever you want to say, but maybe because you had some experience in China um, on the Taiwan issue and these activities in the South China Sea, what is the interest of, of uh, China? Is it, uh, as Waltraud said, uh, I am Xi Jinping, I am the man who brings uh, all uh, areas back into the China, or is it even more expansionist, uh, saying because we have these different, more or less artificial islands? Are they here to to prepare an attack on Taiwan, or let's say, sort of an attack from the Chinese point of view? It's bring Taiwan back home, uh, or is it more? Is it is, do you see a, a, a strong aggressiveness? Uh, in vis-a-vis uh, -vis the neighbors, as for example, Vietnam is looking at China. Vasilis. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Svoboda. Just very quickly, if I may, a short comment on Professor Keller, Keller's really great remarks. I very respectfully tend to disagree when it comes to the German-American uh, axis. I think the summer solstice of German-American friendship is well behind us. And the reason I'm saying this is because, well, there are a lot of great German intellectuals, academics, that they're making this argument about values. But if you go and ask the CEOs in Bavaria, you know, the principal, most powerful uh, people in the German economy, they repeatedly say that the economic future of the world lies in China. 
And they have engaged already substantially in joint ventures and projects. And to a great extent, the German security on electric engines right now lies in, in China. And so it's very difficult for me to see exactly how Germany will align strategically with the United States. Hopefully, um, the German view uh, will somehow tame uh, the security dimension of, 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 of U.S.-China relations and make the United States more amendable uh, in terms of global leadership. But I'm very skeptical seeing kind of, you know, a new Ich bin ein Berliner moment um, in, in, in the in the the German-American relations. And I think the main reason for that, talking about the wider perspective of, of transatlantic relations, is that threat perceptions, threat perceptions are very different than they used to be during the Cold War. I was born in the Gorbachev period, so perhaps uh, Dr. Schwabuda would know more and experience more the threat perception of the Europeans uh, at the peak of the Cold War when hundreds of Soviet battalions were standing in East Berlin and could threaten to invade West Berlin or when the Soviets were patrolling the Baltic Sea. We don't have the Chinese battalions on the Central European Front. We don't don't have Chinese strategic submarines patrolling the Mediterranean or, or the Baltic Sea. So the threat is very different today. The European perceptions of Chinese threat is very different than they used to be about the Russians in the Cold War. And so I think because of that, the Europeans will try to hedge and will try to make the most out of their economic engagement with China. And if you, if we have one country here, that's Germany, I've crisscrossed about 30 cities in China. And I saw not just first tier cities like Beijing and Shenzhen and Shanghai, second tier and third tier cities as well. And you know the big German corporations are everywhere. Uh, there are German houses, which are basically incubators to support entrepreneurial engagement between German researchers and, and entrepreneurs and Chinese researchers and entrepreneurs. And why should uh, you know Germans just give this up? Because Washington's has a different strategic perspective. So this very respectfully, I uh, tend to disagree with Professor Keller. And now on uh, Dr. Svoboda's question about the South China Sea and Taiwan. So two things here. When it comes to the South China Sea, my understanding is that China wants a strategic buffer zone. So you cannot be a superpower if you have not, if you have not developed a fully fledged uh, a nuclear triad. And a fully fledged nuclear triad means that you need to have strategic submarines able to be lost into the vastness of the oceans. Now, if you look the East China Sea, because of geography, you have South Korea, U.S. Treaty ally, you have Japan, U.S. Treaty ally, you have Taiwan, not a treaty ally, but very close defense relations with the U.S. It's basically impenetrable for the Chinese. The Chinese cannot send their strategic submarines into the ocean through the East China Sea. And my understanding is that the South China Sea, which has the size of the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico combined, I think larger than the Mediterranean, provides them with that deep kind of strategic depth and allows them to, you know, push their strategic submarines into the vastness of the oceans and develop their strategic uh, nuclear triad, which is essential when it comes to their deterrence strategy. And um, uh, on Taiwan, uh, you know, I, I tend to be very ignorant. I think it would be a strategic suicide if uh, the Chinese were engaging in a highly aggressive and military invasion of Taiwan. First of all, although game um, 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 uh, models in the U.S. show that most probably the Chinese will win the war, that would most probably be a Pyrrhic victory. Uh, and I would immediately see the international community solidifying against them. And, you know, it's not just taking over Taiwan, it's also China being able to defeat the U.S. fleet in the global choke points, in the Malacca Strait, in the Suez Canal, in the Panama Canal, because what the U.S. is going to do if there is a crisis in Taiwan, most probably it is not going to fight the war next to China, where China enjoys an absolute superiority because of 
of its missile systems, but they're going to fight the war in those choke points and they're going to struggle the energy sources of the Chinese economy. So if, you know, if China really invades Taiwan, I think that could be a really strategic suicide uh, for Xi Jinping. And we haven't, I mean, Voltra was, I think you're right, 2035 is a great date, um, uh, but uh, they can achieve a lot of other things like becoming leaders in 5G and uh, advanced manufacturing and industry four and so on. And um, I'm not quite sure that the Taiwanese question would have been resolved by uh, 2035. And just a, la a last point, if I may, um, on Russia. I think that was a great, great um, uh, insight by Professor uh, Vagelin. So back in the Cold War, uh, the pivotal state was China. And that was a strategic advantage because when Nixon landed in Beijing, basically the whole path of the Cold War changed and the Soviet Union was in decline and strategically they had no, uh, no other steady pillar to support them. Now, the pivotal state is Russia. And I think the problem with China-Russia relations is that is a relationship, the strategic relationship of convenience. Now, when I was in Tsinghua, I saw a lot of revanchism by the Chinese youth. So there was a map with Vladivostok and there was some Chinese students who basically said, you know, this is not a Russian city. This is a Chinese city. Uh, and, and at the same time, there was this big debate back in 2014 and 15 in China about establishing a treaty ally with Russia. And basically, Xi Jinping basically said no. So we're not going to have a treaty ally. We're having a strategic relations, a relationship of convenience. And I believe as soon as Brussels, Moscow, and Moscow, Washington uh, relationship becomes more stable, that's going to create an immediate breach, maybe not a big breach, but certainly destabilize the strategic partnership between Moscow and Beijing. I think can, can I? Yeah, of course, uh, please reply. Yeah, yeah I, I need to. Uh, I, I want to reply briefly to what Vasily said. Uh, well, well, first of all, let me clarify that I never used the word German. I don't like it when people put words in my mouth that I never used. And and secondly, um, my comments were referring to trade issues, not to military issues. Um, so. Um, you know, I don't want my my comments to be misinterpreted in in uh, terms that that I never referred to. Okay, we can come to that perhaps later. So, Sami, uh, Vasily is a bit more skeptical about uh, an alliance between Russia and, and China, um, mainly also because China maybe is in in a, in a better or in a more powerful position. But uh, if there is some parallel activities uh, between Russia and China now, what should Europe sh do? Uh, or would it be that Europe does or should care more about the Ukraine issue and uh, the US more about the Chinese issue? Or how, do you, how should re Europe react to that kind of at least parallel, even if not coordinated, uh, crisis situation in Ukraine and in the Strait of Taiwan? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think very interestingly, Jürgen Taylor said at the very beginning of his second statement, he said, you know, whenever we um, um, have to decide in Europe with whom to side, we should go with the country that is, close, is closest to us. I hope I understood you correctly, Jürgen Taylor. And this is, of course, the US. Um, I just wanted to remind you of the fact that during World War II, uh, the US actually sided uh, with Stalin to fight against Hitler. And uh, I think um, this shows us that under certain geostrategical conditions, we might be forced to side with a country that does not share our values because this is the geostrategic and militarily uh, best um, choice to make. And uh, it's quite interesting if you, if you read into for example, reminiscences of Roosevelt or his letters that he wrote to Churchill, you saw that she actually was extremely close to Uncle Joe, right, in, in handling the situation. And 
Uh, if you think about the millions of millions of um, support that the uh, U.S. actually gave to the Soviet Union in order to make the Soviet Union capable of fighting against uh, Nazi Germany, you will see that you know there are certain situations where you cannot um, go with the friend you would like um, to have as a friend because of certain geostrategic uh, constellations. And this does not imply um, Hannes, that I think, you know, we should now be best friends with Russia and then, you know, everything is solved. But I think the uh, very interesting situation, triangular situation of which uh, Vasilis uh, Trigas also wrote, uh, spoke, you know, is when we look back into the 1970s, we see how the U.S. could actually make a, a brave step into something that nobody had anticipated before in suddenly, you know, deciding to go with China. And we already heard what the, the long-term consequences were actually um, uh, the fact that the uh, Soviet Union no longer exists. And I think these are sort of some of the strategic uh, options we should have in mind, which implies that, uh, according to my research, in a binary situation, where you think like in the, during the Cold War, these two countries are actually deciding on everything that is happening in the world. If you happen to have a third alternative, as, for example, China during the uh, late 1960s, early 1970s, then you, you're actually suddenly able to give much more fluidity and dynamism to the situation. So, uh, you know, the, the question is always, which of the countries is actually the pivot country in a triangular situation? Right? Of course, the U.S. wants to be the pivot and then see that it can control everybody else. But uh, we see quite obviously that the, uh, uh, that um, the U.S. is not uh, able anymore to to sort of act as the pivot in a situation where it can control both China and Russia simultaneously. And I think this is something we should actually use as a starting point for developing our own strategy. How can we uh, influence this situation um, by not giving leverage to any of those belligerent forces um, around the world. It's, it's not only uh, China and um, maybe some people in the US and maybe some people in Russia and maybe some people in Iran and maybe some people in Turkey and so on and so forth and so on and so forth that are actually developing this kind of belligerency because the country that has been leading the world for so many decades, the US, are not able to lead the world anymore. And in this situation, Europe should stand up and um, make a geopolitically um, correct assessment of the forces and then look for its own active role in this situation. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, maybe answer to this question by Ron Willis that was uh, asked in the chat. It's a very challenging question. And I think uh, many of my colleagues working on China actually try to find an answer to you know what is going to happen if China dominates the world? What will be different from the way the US dominate, has dominated the world? And um, uh, I must say that um, it is extremely difficult to answer the question because China has been, um, has not been a dominant force in the world for such a long time in the very direct sense of the world. I think it has been influencing world politics from a very indirect perspective for, for, for many, many decades, but it has not played a very active uh, dominant role. So what are the kind of references we, we can sort of think of in order to come to, um, to an answer to this question? And of course, uh, when you talk to people who are more in favor of China taking over a more dominant role, they actually uh, think of China in terms of ancient China, a country that believed uh, in itself as the center of the world, as the center of all under heaven. Maybe you have already seen the translation of the book by Zhao Qingyang, who actually sort of um, sort of uh, has a picture of China as a, a peace-giving country uh, to the whole world that lets everybody be the way the different countries in the different world want to be. And uh, so it, it just sits there in the middle like a Buddha, uh, making everybody feel relaxed and peaceful and, you know, everything is okay. 
And on the other hand, we have, of course, people who say, you know, but China is a Marxist Leninist country, even though some of us tend to forget this, you know, at once they take over, they will make us, you know, uh, turn our countries into socialist countries and things like this, they will export their revolution. And I tend to say, you know, from my point of view, in order to understand what China is going to do when it dominates the world, we have to see what China, what the Han Chinese majority does in China by dominating over the 56 minorities. And if you had asked this question uh, like 10 to 15 years ago, I would have said as an answer, as I myself actually did research among Kazakhs in, in Xinjiang for several years, I lived among Kazakh nomads and I would have given you the answer. Uh, I think China has learned to live with the diversity of its own country in continuation of a very wise policy of diversity that actually ruled over, over Qing China and Qing China is the last dynastic uh, China we have so far encountered. But unfortunately, um, uh, in recent years, um, another kind of Han Chinese attitude towards minorities um, has come to the fore. And we all know that China is now sort of propagating the idea of homogenizing the situation in China so that um, no matter whether you belong to minority or whether you belong to the Han Chinese majority, you are supposed to live to uh, according to a mainstream lifestyle that, according to the elites in China, is the best you can have at the uh, at this moment. And if this is actually the model for them to rule the world, this would mean that um, I think we in Europe can expect to be a place which is wonderful for Chinese tourists to come and enjoy, but um, the Chinese don't will not give us the um, uh, sort of um, the task to develop our technology, to develop and innovate our societies and things like this. I think they will sort of um, give different tasks to different parts of the world. Thank you very much. Uh, um, now, as we have to close our, our session, which is very interesting, could be uh, continued for a very long time. Maybe I can put to all of you the last uh, question. Uh, we didn't speak too much about multilateralism, which was in the title of our, of our discussion, but uh, I think uh, you mentioned, of course, uh, WTO and was mentioned by others and the WHO. So my question is to all of you, uh, briefly, please, what is the future uh, the world is going to? Is it going to a re-establishment of this uh, traditional multilateralism and strengthening of multilateralism? Or is it necessary to go into, let's say, the dif these different alliances? As was mentioned, Europe should, of course, have close relations with Russia and try to solve some issue then also with China in an investment agreement, but also should go in, in um, having stronger contact with, for example, India, another big power. And uh, then of course the, the trade agreement which I mentioned with, uh, with uh, uh, Japan, uh, Vietnam uh, and so on. So in what direction is the world going or should go? Is multilateralism really something which can be reestablished or are we going into a phase of, of differentiated bilateral agreements between different powers in order to, let's say, have some sort of an equilibrium in this multipolar world. So maybe uh, we go in the same order, but thought, what's your opinion? Well, this is not exactly my field, but um, I would say as long as we can save some parts of multilateralism, we should try it. So I think there's still, first of all, there is a commitment of China to multilateralism. It's even stated in the recent five-year plan explicitly. Uh, to my personal opinion, China is not maybe the salvator of WTO. It's rather the biggest problem of WTO. But still, WTO is a place where we could speak. And this is the one thing. And the UN is also not bad yet. 
And we didn't mention one a multilateral activity of China, which is a peacekeeping. And China is the biggest provider for soldiers in the peacekeeping course. You could say, well, it's just trying to get some military experience, but It's, it's there and it's committed. And why should we not work on these rests of multilateralism to, to improve the world? So I'm not very fond of, of, of uh, helping the two powers to become either the first one or the two big ones or so on. So I would really try to find an alliance of the others to, to contain the big powers. And India is, for my, in my opinion, a very important pivot. So Europe should not have an Asian strategy, but the Indo-Pacific strategy and should not forget about India. Also, India is a, could be a, a source of conflict. We had such uh, armed uh, clashes between China and India already, and uh, China uh, protecting or, or uh, so to say, supporting Pakistan is another uh, rather delicate issue, and so it would be good to, to work together with India. So I'm, I'm a multilateralist. Jürgen. Yes, I'm a multilateralist as well. <laughs> Very much well, so. You asked about <laughs> Yes. Yes. Um, you ask about the future of multilateralism. Uh, multilateralism. Uh, uh, forecasting is very difficult, especially if it concerns the future. So I don't know. But as I am a multilateralist, uh, yes, of course, uh, multilateralism is uh, extremely important. Um, in, and, and we see this more clearly now than ever. You know, we haven't talked about uh, environmental issues, uh, about health issues, pandemic, uh, and, and many, many other uh, very important, the most important challenges of our time are challenges that we can only master uh, if, if we uh, go back to multilateralism. Um, And my hope is that with a new U.S. administration, um, we will have a move towards multilateralism. But every new border, every ex Brexit or whatever exit is, is bad news because we have to pull. I'm, I'm naive here, of course, I know. Uh, but every border is, uh, is, a, um, is a step in the wrong direction. Every new border is a step in the wrong direction. Uh, we need global, very desperately, we need global solutions. We need, need global agreements on a trade scale as well. Uh, and, and therefore, yes, multilateralism uh, is, is the future and it's the only future and the only hope. Thank you. Uh, Vasilis, uh, maybe you can take up also the question of Angela Kane uh, on, on uh, how can we, maybe some others will come in as well, how can we deal with multilateralism or support multilateralism if uh, we have in China leadership which is autocratic and not only in China, in other countries as well, how can multilateralism function if we have democracy on one side and authoritarian rule on the other side and what Susanne mentioned we have violation of human basic human rights with a big ma a minority in China how can this come together uh, is that multi on the other hand one can of course say multilateralism is here in order to bring countries together who have different system different kind of civilization so what is your answer to that Vasilis? Well, let me just say I have benefited enormously uh, by Angela Kane's mentorship at the Svarsman College. Um, and so it's amazing that we are all multilateralists by conviction. Uh, and so let me integrate Angela's question with Ron Will's question about uh, China as a unipolar power, because basically unipolarity is the exact opposite of multipolarity and multilateralism is not going to happen. It's not going to happen. China is not going to be a unipolar power. The U U.S. unipolarity was an aberration in history. The absolute and relative power that the U.S. enjoyed after the end of the Cold War until the financial crisis is not going to be repeated. No other country in the world would get that relative power that the U.S. enjoyed back then. And so when we talk about multilateralism, I have to stress again the very fact that in the past 
five years, four years, when Trump was supporting unilateralism and was destroying the international order, the EU has been the guardian of the multilateralist system. And I mentioned the European Union's engagement with ASEAN. Now, think about it for a moment. ASEAN is a region of 700 million. And the subcontinent is a region of about 1.5, 1.6 billion. And those populations are going to increase in the next 10, 20 years. So if you add the subcontinent and ASEAN combined, you're going to have a flourishing, dynamic economic region of about 2.7 billion people, almost twice the population of China. So my argument is the EU, simply by engaging in doing trade deals, in investments, and supporting the solid growth of the of the Indian subcontinent and the ASEAN region is automatically supporting multilateralism. And as a matter of fact, solid modernization dynamics and economic growth in that region of 2.7 billion people means an automatic balancer to a rising China. Not because the EU is trying to contain China like perhaps the EU is trying to do, but because the EU is really engaging uh, with, uh, with the region to support the modernization and development efforts of, of the local governments there. So I think the strongest strategy we can have as Europeans is to double down or, uh, on our effort for more trade deals, more investment deals with the subcontinent and ASEAN. And just to conclude, we have a very successful model. The model that Germany followed to penetrate the Chinese economy in the 80s and 90s and build those great joint ventures and transfer technology from Europe to China can work very well in India, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, and in ASEAN. So if Europe learns how to operationalize the German model of economic di diplomacy, perhaps the multilateral and multipolar world with the rise of ASEAN is, with, is with, within grasp. Thank you. Maybe we need uh, more uh, acceptance of risks uh, in Europe and also in Germany. Uh, they have their own problems uh, in order to, to go forward with this investment because I see more and more, uh, let's say, a tendency to refrain from this kind of risk-taking investments and uh, uh, globalization is a bad word for many people. But uh, what you say here is, of course, uh, is a plea for at least, uh, let's say, a considerate and sophisticated globalization we have to enhance and uh, combination uh, of uh, European knowledge and Asian dynamism. Susanne, uh, unless somebody else wants to say anything, you have the last word. You can bring us the future, the bright future, after you, your first comment was uh, showing us the bleak uh, situation. Uh, now we have to have the bright future we are going to. At least we should try to go to. Please, Susanne. Well, let me go back into the past and say, you know, when the US was actually on the rise to become a world power, it started this development by founding the League of Nations, which it interestingly was not part of at the beginning. And it had a great idea, which Woodrow Wilson at the time propagated as his so-called 14 points. And I think this is something that we so far have not seen from China. China uh, has not yet developed a strategic orientation or a theoretical framework or a vision for how this world is going to be in the future. And um, it also has so far refrained from actually establishing multilateral organizations such as the League of Nations uh, back at the end of um, World War One, And we only have like an attempt and which by uh, Paul Orban just mentioned, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is the only multilateral, electoral, uh, multilateral organization which China so far created. And um, I think uh, we can see very closely that China is sort of using multilateralism in a very pragmatic when, uh, uh, manner. So, for example, the uh, entrance into the WTO back in 2000, and 2001, 
it was actually an enormously important step for the development in China and especially for the development of the Chinese economy. And at the time, uh, Du Rongji, the prime minister of China, said repeatedly, you know, we have to actually uh, go and, and achieve this one aim uh, to be a member of the WTO because this makes going back to uh, Stalinist times in China impossible because the country is in a setting in a framework that wouldn't allow for this to happen. Uh, but uh, then once China became a member of the WTO, the problem sort of seemed to be solved and China was trying to use the WTO to its uh, own um, advantage. And whenever the WTO was uh, sort of um, criticizing China, then China would sort of back uh, from the WTO and not be very active, sort of um, just be sort of a compliant, more or less compliant member. And the same is true for the UN. China fought for a long time. The People's Republic of China fought for a long time to become a member of the UN. Once China was a member of the UN, it was a very, very inactive, compliant member of the UN for a very long time. But if we look at the uh, WHO, and I think that is really interesting, we see that uh, China is all thinking of the possibility to actually change these organizations from the inside. So they actually using multilateralism to their own aims, and they try to, for example, make their influence felt in the WHO in order for this organization uh, to be an organization the way it has been for a long time, but with more and more Chinese influence. And I think this is the model we, have going, we are going to have to deal with in, in the future. Um, but this means that at least China is looking at multilateralism as one part of its overall uh, foreign policy portfolio. And I think that the fact that they are still thinking about this multilateralism as something that is important for them should actually motivate us to get very to be very active in multilateralism and to use every opportunity to speak to China to um, to start bargaining on certain issues with China so that we can actually also use multilateralism from our side uh, in order to be able to contain certain policies that we think are not good for world peace. Uh, from the side of uh, China. All in all, I think that no matter what we think would be a good constellation, our world is developing into a situation where we speak of uh, multipolarity. Uh, I think it's quite interesting that China used to sort of herald multipolarity as the future setting of the world. It has been a little bit uh, more silent on this issue during the last years, but if you look into what political political scientists in China actually produce in terms of developing a Chinese theory of international relations, I think it is still sort of backed by this idea that there can be multipolarity in this world. And um, there are, of course, other people who sort of look at the world as being ruled by the US and China with the US and China sort of um, looking at each other at eye level and sort of trying to rule the world according to this uh, mutual agreement. So I think from a European point of view, we should um, try to develop a theory of international relations, which make the idea of multipolarity more consistent and more a strategic orientation for the future of Europe and for the future of the world. And I think if we can do this, um, the old uh, sort of idea about the balance of power, which sort of originated, if you if you allow me to say this, originated from Vienna uh, and the Metternich. So this idea of balance of power would then be an idea that we could actually um, propose for the setting of the world in which no major country is actually dominating the world at large. And I think that would be a positive um, vision for the future. I hope I fulfilled uh, the expectations of our moderator with this answer.
Yeah, absolutely. And with the mentioning of Metternich, it's not also Europe can be satisfied, but also China, because it was a combination of, you know, peace and stability in the outside, but also censorship and control in the inside. So that uh, Metternich could be also a, a good example for, for Mr. Xi Jinping. Uh, thank you very much, all of you. I think it was a fascinating discussion, as also Stephanie Fenker, the other director, just wrote in the chat. Uh, I want to thank, of course, also the, the technician, so to say, uh, Lucas, who uh, made it uh, possible that we had a, a, a you know, broadcast without interruption. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I think we should continue at some time, uh, look into the two events. Hopefully the, the more, uh, you know, optimistic end of Susani is more the reality than the bleak picture at the beginning. Also, I... I have uh, some understanding also for that uh, uh, bleak picture, unfortunately. So anyway, thank you very much. It was fascinating. It was interesting. It was dynamic. And I think uh, uh, many of our listeners and viewers will be satisfied uh, to have participated in it. And again, thank you very much. And I hope you have a nice evening, maybe more comfortable than just a Zoom event like this one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.